Proudly, we hail. New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Army. Our story today is entitled, The House That Eddie Won. It's the story of an infantry private, a machine gunner in World War II. He once helped a man in a foreign country build a house. He had no idea how handy it might be some years later. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment. But first, if you're a young man of service age and expect to serve a tour of duty in the near future, I'd like to take just a moment before our story to tell you about a training program that can help you a great deal in planning for military life. It's called the Reserve for You Training Program. Completely realistic and up-to-date, it gives you an opportunity to choose your own technical training course before you enlist. Now, here's how it works. First, you make a written application choosing from over a hundred different technical training courses. If you qualify and a vacancy exists, you'll receive a letter telling you that you have a reserved seat in the course of your choice. And this letter is a very important document because it's your written guarantee that you will attend the course of your own choice where you'll learn, get on-the-job training, and serve your country at the same time. Now, the decision must be made by you. And to give you the complete facts and help you make this decision, we've prepared a colorful booklet called Reserved for You, and it's yours for the asking. I suggest that you pick up your free copy at your nearest United States Army recruiting station. If you have any slanted ideas about Army life, this booklet will bring you up to date on the wonderful outfit your Uncle Sam runs these days. Visit the friendly people at your local recruiting station and pick up your free copy of the booklet Reserved for You. And now your United States Army presents the proudly we hail production, The House That Eddie Won. You know how it is when the guys finish a tough day in the field after a shower and chow and when the weapons and equipment are stacked away, there's no place like the company day room. You can shoot a few games of pool, relax over some cards, and maybe write that letter that's so long overdue. But of course, this being a modern army and ours being a modern company, we even got a TV set in our day room. Day room. That's a funny word for you. What soldier ever has a chance to use it in the daytime? It ought to be called a night room. But that's not the point of my story. Anyhow, the other night, I happened to be walking down the company street, and I turned into the day room just to look around. The usual activities were in progress, and a group of the men were clustered around the TV set watching a prize fight. Wasn't much of a fight. The two palookas on the screen must have thought they were booked to do a dance. Because I don't think one of them landed a punch in the entire round. A strong old lady could have clobbered them both with one hand tied behind her back. The men were getting bored with it, too, and they were about to switch the dial to look for something else when I happened to notice one of the fighters sitting in his corner waiting for the next round to begin. That is, I didn't notice him. I did get a good look at the guy who was working over him. Hold on a minute, Jones. Leave it on. Hey, Sarge, who needs this? I want to look at the guy in the corner. What about him? I know him. Who, the manager? Yeah. Well, it's got to be. It's Eddie Taylor. <laughs> Poor guy. He's managing fighters now. Yeah? Well, if that's his fighter, he's sure stuck with a meatball. You never heard of Eddie Taylor, did you, Jones? He was a pretty good club fighter. Must have been before my time, Sarge. Used to be in my outfit. Well, here goes another round of nothing. You sure you want to look at this, Sarge? There might be some wrestling coming in from Chicago. Leave it on a couple of minutes. I wasn't watching the so-called fight. I kept hoping for the camera to show the corner so I could get another look at Eddie Taylor. Every now and then, the action, or what there was of it, would swing over to the corner and I could see Eddie. Eddie was really suffering. Eddie was a great boxer, but evidently he hadn't been able to teach his boy much. I walked over to the telephone booth and I called Major Morrissey over at Battalion. Wasn't there, so I tried his quarters. 
So, are you watching the fight tonight by any chance? Well, I know, Major, it's not much to look at, but if you get a good look at the tall boy's corner, you might see an old friend of ours. Yes, sir, Eddie Taylor. Well, I'd called the Major. He called Captain Roberts. All in all, about ten people in the battalion suddenly became interested in a very ordinary fight. Those were the ten of us, officers and non-coms, who'd been with the old outfit in World War II. The ten of us got together later that night, and we sent Eddie Taylor a telegram. His boy had lost the decision, but the telegram read, As far as we're concerned, Eddie, you're a champ. We got to talking about Eddie. And that nightmare week that Eddie and I had to live through back in France about 11 years ago. We'd been moving fast against the enemy. In two days, we'd knocked him back 50 miles. Then suddenly, he made one of those decisions to dig in and fight. I had two machine guns in my section. We were running out of ammo. We called back for more, but something must have happened because it never showed up. How you doing in here? You don't have but two to three hundred rounds left, Sergeant Brady. What is that ammo, son? Keep firing, I'll see that you get it. Taylor, any sign of the ammo? No, haven't spotted them yet. Both guns are almost empty. Where's your jeep? Just down the hill. Well, let's you and me hop in and hot-foot it back and pick some thirty caliber up. Sergeant Grady. Yes, sir. A first platoon is going to attack. I'll need overhead fire. How's your ammo? Very bad, Lieutenant. I have to go back and pick some up. And I count on supporting fire in twenty minutes. Yes, sir, you can count on it. Come on, Taylor, let's make time. Taylor and I raced back in the jeep to where we'd set up the supply dump. We loaded up and started back. We could still make it, but although we'd only been gone some five minutes, already we could tell that something new was happening. Road's under fire, Sarge. I know, but we've got to get through. Okay. Hold on to your hat. Pull her off the road, Taylor. We won't be any good to them if we get ourselves blown up. Hey, Sarge, what's happening up there? Search me, but the Jerry sure have this road zeroed in. They're waiting for the ammo. I know. Uh, could we each maybe carry a box? Be an hour getting there. Uh, there's another road about a half mile to the left. It's got a little bit of defilade. Maybe we could use that. Okay, get going. Well, we didn't have any choice. Nothing could get through that rain of mortar fire that was blasting down on the road. But I knew how desperately the ammo was needed. Especially now, because this heavy fire could only mean one thing. The enemy was counterattacking. We cut across a field and found the other road. It was on a reverse slope, which meant it had the benefit of some natural cover. Where's this road lead, Taylor? It uh, runs along the same way the other one does. Goes through a town called uh, Bessieres or something. And then it hooks up with the first road near the hill. From there, we can hand carry the ammo. Listen. What? I don't hear anything. That's it. Huh? Firing stopped. Now we can cut back over to the main road. Not here, Sarge. I could never push this jeep through that plowed field. We'll have to keep going. I wonder why they stopped firing. Our guys must have beat back the attack. I don't like it. It's too quiet. Got to be quiet, Sarge. By this time, the guys shouldn't have a single round of ammo left. Can't you get any more out of this jeep? Hey, I got my foot in the floorboards now. Listen to that. Somebody must have started up again. Listen, those machine guns in on ours. Hey, Sarge, wait a minute. Wait, am I crazy? No, unless I'm off my nut, too. Where's that firing coming from? Uh, it's off to the right. How'd the Jerry's get there? It has to be coming from where we just were. How did the Jerry's get in back of us? Hey, Sarge, tell me something. Where are we racing to with the ammo? If the fire is in back of us, then our guys can't be where we're, where we're going to. Let's go back. Back where? The Jerry's are between us and the outfit. Our chance is to keep moving, go past the town. Yeah, but what the... Maybe they broke through only in one place right behind us. They haven't gone through the town yet. Maybe we can cut over from there. Hey! What... Oh, oh. Taylor. Huh? Taylor! Yeah. I, uh, I guess I'm all right, I think. Hey, man, what happened, huh? Must have ridden right over a mine. Look at the Jeep. Now, uh, what's left of the Jeep? We're lucky we're still able to look at it. Can you walk? Yeah, I think so. This is like the first time I ever got knocked out, you know it. I was in the ring with a guy who had 10 pounds on me. He clipped me one time. I didn't know you were a boxer. Yeah, yeah, but it's a long story. Well, now, listen, some other time. Let's get going. Where to? We'll have to get past the town. Then we'll be able to see downhill. After that, we've got no plans. Maybe you think you've been lonesome sometimes. Well, let me tell you, there's no feeling at all like the one you get when you're separated from your outfit. And you don't know where it is. And you don't know where the enemy is, either. One piece of luck we did have. There were trees along the side of the road, and they gave us what the Army manual likes to call concealment. 
We tried to guess where the enemy was by listening to the occasional bursts of firing that seemed to be all around us. If our side held the little town Bessier, we'd be all right. If not, well, that was looking a little bit too far ahead. Finally, the road widened and there were no more trees. We saw the town, a small, sleepy little French village with a twisting main street that ran for a few blocks and then gave out into countryside again. We didn't hear a sound. It was an open space of about 50 yards between us and the first house. I didn't like the idea of just walking across it, but the only way to find out was to find out. Well, let's go, Sarge, if we're going. Looks quiet, but you can't tell. What we'll have to do is go over to that house and find out. You stay behind the tree. Cover me, and I'll give you a whistle to come up. Hey, wait, now, wait a minute, Sarge. Let me... White and both of us getting it. This way, one of us has a chance. Just keep me covered. if anybody's in the house. Well, kid, you're soon gonna find out. Just a man and a woman. Civilians. That's a break. Looks like neither us or the Jerry's are bothering with the town just yet. Better get Taylor up here. I heard your whistle, Sarge. What's up? See for yourself. Looks quiet. Let's go inside and ask them what they know. Although that's not going to be easy. I can't talk French. That's all right. I can parlay a little bit. Yeah, what'd you learn? School? Oh, it's a long story. I'll save it. Come on. Uh, bonjour. Huh? Hey, what'd you say to us? Well, uh, all, all I said was hello. I don't ask these people what's the matter. They look like they're ready to fly through the roof. You? You are American? Well, this guy talks English. You are American? Hey, Sarge, look. Over against the wall. German helmets and field packs. What are you doing here? The, the Bosch are in the village. They've taken over in each house. Three of them will stay here. Germans in this house? Where? They've gone to their field kitchen to get their rations. Are you attacking the village again? Sister, there's only two of us. Okay, Taylor, we found out. Let's beat it. Wait. Look. Through the window. The Bosch. A group of them moving along the road. Is there a back way? That also can be seen from the road. Please, please, they cannot find you here. You? Uh, I have seen you before. Oh, me? But I cannot remember where. Yet I never forget a face. Henri, Henri, the Bosch are coming back. Where have I seen this American before? Oh, you stupid man. You stand here as though you are on a boulevard in peacetime. I have it. I know him. I know him. We must hide them. Hey, he knows you, Taylor. Yeah, you know, he, he, he looks familiar to me, too. Can you hide us? Quickly, follow me. You will go down the basement. There is your husband. You asked if we had any wine. Where he? He's down in the cellar. He, he has gone down for some. Otto, we go and have the Frenchman look. Make sure he gives us the good wine. Eh, Frau? Or has he hidden it all by this time? Come, Otto. But, but I tell you, he will bring the best we have. We make sure. Come, Otto. You are listening to the proudly we hail production, The House That Eddie Won. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. High school seniors, ensure a secure, well-paying future by preparing for it now. The United States Army's Reserved for You program will guarantee you a classroom seat in an exciting Army technical career course before you enlist. You'll get top-notch training and on-the-job experience while serving side-by-side -side with America's finest young men and women. The choice is wide open, and it's all yours to make. High school graduates can take their choice of from more than 100 interesting courses. Everything from atomic technician to welding. The fact-filled booklet, Reserved for You, tells you all about this program. You'll learn of many other fine Army benefits, too, like regular pay increases, promotions, exciting travel assignments, and unbeatable leisure time activities. Get in on the swing. Get your free copy of Reserved for You by visiting or writing 
your nearest United States Army recruiting station. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of The House That Eddie Won. Sergeant First Class George Grady is recalling a World War II experience. He and Private Eddie Taylor had been separated from their outfit during a surprise German counterattack. They had made their way to a tiny French town near the city of Nancy. The town was called Begiere. They entered a house to find out what the situation was, only to discover that German troops were occupying the village and were billeting in the houses. Three German soldiers are just about to re-enter the house, just as Henri leads Grady and Taylor down to the cellar. One of the Germans suggests to his comrades that they go downstairs to see if Henri has hidden away any good wine. Here is your wine. Ah, that is the slop you feed your pigs. I will go down and see what you really have. You will not find better than this, see? It is vintage 1937. I still have a little left. I will see for myself. Come, Otto. This wine is good enough for me. The man gives us the best he has. Climb down the cellar yourself. I am tired. I would rather sleep. You have a bottle. Drink. Enjoy yourself. Madam, you have prepared our beds in the other room? Yes. I will use the big fatter one. That one is for me. We will see about that. Suppose they will go down the cellar. We will not think about that now. The push are tired. They have fought all day. Now they will sleep. Prepare some food for the American. Remarkable, the black-haired one. I know. But from where? Have we any meat left? Yes, there is some. Give it to them. But it's all we have. Give it to them. Because of the dark-haired one, we own this house. His name is Taylor. Oh, you have never heard of him. The American, the prize fighter. Five years ago in Nancy. Recall? Oh. He's the same one? What you are doing? My wife, prepare some soup for us. Did I not see you eating your supper when we arrived? We are finishing now. What is this talk about how hungry you Frenchmen are? I see you always eat. Bring me another bottle of wine. Give me the plates. I will carry them downstairs. Do we have more of the good wine? No, but at this time it does not matter. He will not know. I will pour some of the red wine into the same bottle. The others, too, they seem ordinary enough fellows. We shall not have trouble with them, I hope, Henri. We must keep this one drunk. Here is some food. Eat quickly. Gee, thanks a lot. Man, I'm starving. Hey, you wouldn't have some uh, coffee, would oh, you? Oh, I am sorry. We have not seen coffee since 1940. I got some powdered coffee. Make some for all of us. <laughs> the bush, too. How long do you think we can stay here? Who knows? We must leave from minute to minute. I will be back as soon as I can. Where is some wine? Huh, here. You remember where this guy knows you from? Yeah, yeah, I think I do. Where? Well... You know, I used to box. I was a pro before the war. I'd won a couple, loads a couple, you know. I look good because I could move fast. I know what to do with my hands. I could outbox anybody I ever met, but I never did have much of a punch. Never knocked nobody out. The only question was, could I stay away from a big gorilla long enough to win on points, see? Sometimes I could, sometimes I'd get tagged. Eddie Taylor. Seems I might have read that name in the sports page. Yeah, probably the wire reports of out-of-town fights. Well... One day, I hooked up with this manager. He says to me, Eddie, you know where we can make a barrel of dough? In Europe, that's where. I can get you matches in England, France, Belgium. There, you could do real good. So I figured, what did I have to lose? <laughs> so I went. You know something? I did good, too. There's a big city not far from here, Nancy, where they really like me. They kept booking fights for me here. Naturally, I got to know this part of the country pretty well, too. I built up a nice local following. In fact... I even thought of staying around for a couple of years, but the war killed that. Is that where this guy, Henri, knows you from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, now I recognize him, too. See, he used to sit ringside at all my fights. <laughs> he was my biggest fan. <laughs> well, one night, he leans over in the ring, see, while I'm waiting for the bell. And he says, uh, 
Hey, kid, you win tonight, I'd be able to buy a house and uh, get married. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Did you win? Well, I had a rough time, but I came out on top. I wonder what's going on upstairs. What is that I see? Coffee? Where do you get coffee? We have saved it for a long time. Uh, I will have more wine. No, no, I will get this myself. Henri, what can we do? Shh! Wait, someone is coming outside. Roger, what news? Henri, is it? Are your Germans asleep? Now listen, the Americans are attacking the village. Let us help them. Where are the rifles? In Robert's cellar. I'll meet you there. At once. I must go down and help the men in the cellar. Where does this pig hide this wine? Uh, here we have it. They're looking for wine. Here it is. I thank you. This is the best wine I have ever tasted. I was afraid he would see you. Oh, too drunk, I guess. I must get you out of here. The Americans are attacking. There are ten of us resistance fighters in the village. With your two rifles, we are twelve. We will take them from the rear. Oh, that's the best offer I've had all day. How many Jerry's you figure are in the town? I would say almost two companies. I wish we had more firepower, we could really help out. If we had more firepower, we could really cut them to bits, but we have no ammunition. What kind of firepower do you have? We have a machine gun. Great, that's just what we need. But no ammunition for oh, it. Oh, wouldn't you know it. What kind of a machine gun? An American model. It was dropped to us by parachute. Listen, listen, what kind of American machine gun? What caliber, 50 or, uh, or 30? What difference? It is useless. What kind? Oh. It is what you call the light air cool 30. Henri, it's just a chance, but listen. A quarter of a mile from here up the road, we cracked up our jeep. Oui? We were carrying cases of 30 caliber ammo belted for machine guns. 30 caliber. Now, can a couple of your guys sneak out and see what you can salvage? Machine gun ammunition. The attack begins. Else! Else! The Germans must be moving up. Come with me. Here. Climb out the cellar window and hide behind the house. I will get my men. I will send some of them for the ammunition. The rest will stay with you. Looks like they're holding our guys back, Sarge. Why don't we start hitting them from the rear? Let's see what the story is on the machine gun. Robert and Paul should return shortly. Fortunately, you are here. You are more familiar with the mechanics of this type of gun. I can't do a thing with it unless I have ammo. Hey, someone's coming. It is Robert and Paul. Yeah, the carrying box. Bring that ammo over here. Sergeant, you had better take command. The enemy line of resistance is up ahead to our left. We'll advance, riflemen first, open up, draw their fire, and leave the rest of this light 30. Feed me a belt, Taylor. This is where you're going to see a real knockout punch. Well, this was one of those real classic situations which don't happen too often, where the enemy is caught between fire in the front and rear. The enemy was caught completely off balance, and in the confusion, they started to run. The fire in all directions. But our guys, sensing the disorder, attacked immediately. It was all over except the surrender. The first platoon to smash into the village was led by Major Morrissey. He was Lieutenant Morrissey then, and he told us the story. Just after we had left to go for the ammo, the Jerrys had attacked in force and swept them back. The Jerrys pushed on for five miles and stopped to regroup. Morrissey admitted that without our attack from the rear, it would have been tough sledding. That night, we all stayed at Henri's house. You see, I never forget the face. You know, Henri, it took a lot of nerve for you to hide us. The Jerry's had found us in your cellar. Oh, I think of bad things. And besides, how could we turn you out of this house? After all, you might say it is uh, Monsieur Taylor's house, too. Did he not win it for us? Hey, Henri, where are you going? Down the cellar for some wine. You sure you're not hiding any German soldiers down there? 
You have to come down and look. No, I don't think so. You know, Henri, somehow, I just trust you. It's been nearly ten years since I saw Eddie Taylor. After the war, he went back to the fight game again. I guess he must have become a manager. He sent me a letter after we wired him that night, and he said, Hey, Sarge, did you see the Palooka I was managing? Well, just about all I can do with him is to take him to France. Because here, when he smells out the joint, there's no way to escape the rotten eggs and tomatoes. But in a little town near Nancy, I know some people who let us hide in the cellar. opportunity is described in the dictionary as a convenient chance, a favorable opening, as in business. And that definition can certainly be applied to the United States Army Medical Service when it comes to the opportunity they offer qualified registered nurses. More and more opportunities, favorable openings in the profession of nursing are now open in the Army Nurse Corps. For example, the Army Nurse Corps offers you a life which combines service with travel, work with recreation. You'll be a commissioned officer with officer's pay and allowances, free service insurance, paid vacation and retirement credits. And in addition, you have the chance of taking postgraduate training in many nursing fields and thus qualify for even further advancement. There are other benefits, too, such as worldwide travel, an attractive uniform, and the chance to serve with the finest men and women in the world. Now, most important of all is the fact that you can contribute your nursing skills to keep the United States Army strong and healthy, ready to perform their mission when needed. By your choice of a career, you have become members of a dedicated profession. You have elected to use your knowledge and skills to serve humanity. For your unselfishness, your efficiency, and your high degree of training, you are universally respected. But if you've reached a point in your career where it's hard to keep your goals in sight, you can't always see where your devotion to your creed is leading, I suggest that this is the time that you should seriously consider the Army Nurse Corps. If you'd like full information on how you can become an Army nurse, write the Surgeon General, Department of the Army, Washington 25, D.C. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center in New York for the United States Army, and this is Mark Hamilton speaking, inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>